Hi, as we go through the list of games for 1998, there is always somehow more and more awesome titles. And this episode is no different. I mean, see for yourself. Oh, and make sure to watch the video to the very end if you're interested in space, physics or aliens at all. Like Shogun Mobile Armor time. Division is a first-person shooter that takes place in a far-off future. How far off? Hard to tell, but I can't even imagine it now, so it must be a good few decades at least. You're Sandro, and you're one of the commanders in the UCA, United Corporate Authority, and a pilot of a mobile combat armor, a giant mech of sorts. The UCA is at constant conflict with the so-called Fallen, a well-known and nefarious criminal organization. The war between the two has taken its toll, not only on the UCA, but on you personally too. It took your brother, best friend and a girlfriend. And I'm sorry for that, cause that's like a deadly triple combo no one should ever have to experience the pain of. All three of them died during one of the missions a year prior, so the wound is still fresh and rather gushing. And just as you were putting it all behind, rebuilding your life back up to try to get better, you're sent on an assignment to kill Gabriel, a new leader of the Fallen. And it will stir up in your past, bringing it all back to surface once more. Such is the life of UCA soldier, I suppose. There are two kinds of levels in Shogo, those that take place in the enemy buildings and installations and they are played with Sanjo out of his armor, infiltrating them on foot, spreading anti-criminal healing pellets via an automatic rifle method of delivery. These are the pills that the enemies can't take on their own and they have to be delivered at the near speed of sound directly into their bodies preferably straight to heart or brain. There are naturally health, ammo and weapon pickups in these stages to help you keep going. The other levels take place outside, mainly in the cities and see Sandro in one of four available mechs, each with their own characteristics, strong and weak sides. The movement here is basically identical to that inside of the building, it's just the scale of things that change as you're in a huge mech. These mechs can transform into vehicles for faster movement, like some kind of a budget transformers, but are unable to defend themselves when they do, so keep that in mind. Outside stages are much better designed, often with fun and unique mechanics to them. For instance, in one of them you have to run around jumping from skyscraper to skyscraper, all the while annihilating the oncoming enemy forces. Most of the story is entirely linear, with no way for you to influence its run in any way whatsoever, but at one point you will be asked to make a decision. It only happens once, but that choice will influence the rest of the game and the ending, so make sure not to miss it. The gameplay itself is hyper fast and action packed with enemies often ganging up on you and uses one of the early real time hit area detection systems, meaning where you actually hit the enemy will be reflected in their behavior and mobility. Shogo is surprisingly fun and worth a play for even today. Dark Vengeance is a third-person perspective fantasy hack-and-slash game very similar in its mechanics to much more famous, well-known and better Tomb Raider. An evil empire has arisen from the dead, yup, it's one of those not really zombie but still quite undead type of situations here, so gather your crucifixes, your holy water and even some garlic for good measure and get ready for anything. The forthcoming of the dead was foretold by the permanent solar eclipse caused by a powerful evil spell. In its wake, the Dark Elves are set to return and take over the land of Amagar. Usually it would have been a problem, but since it's you who's on the case, we can just relax and let the Jesus, I mean let you take the steering wheel and restore the sunlight to the kingdom. Dark Vengeance features three different characters to play as, Nanok the Gladiator, Jetrel the Warlock or Kite the Trickster. And not only they look, feel and play entirely unique to one another, but also have different motivations to why they're on this world saving quest in the first place. So, the choice of a character will change their available movesets as much as which of the 18 levels they will have access to, as some are created for certain characters only. You can carry up to 9 weapons, each of them having their own special kind of damage, abilities and 3 unique attacks. Most puzzles are environmental and require you to either figure out where to open which door or to find keys or levers that are hidden away somewhere. These are not in the forefront of gameplay, so their simplicity is not an issue really. What is though, and completely overshadows really nice graphics and sound design, are the clunky controls, especially those related to camera movement and combat. They require you to often press and or hold a combination of keys to pull off some moves, which is anything but ergonomic. Also, you'll get stuck, often, in walls, in objects, in the floor, everywhere mostly unexpectedly and for no reason. As you can see, Dark Vengeance is rather buggy and playing it will feel at times like playing Ghostbusters from a perspective of a ghost that failed halfway through moving in the wall and just froze inside. It's not a terrible game, not the case here, and there's a lot to like in it, but there's just so much that it does wrong that it's difficult to enjoy it in the long run. Outlaw Racers is a very unique game. It had quite a few neat ideas that were not always well implemented. Nevertheless, it deserves being remembered. 
Not sure if it's worth replaying though. In fact, it's a lot like an average movie that you're fine watching once and appreciating for what it was all about and how it told its story, but then never craving to rewatch it ever again. The races take place in the cities and are for the most part checkpoint based, meaning you have to drive through all of them for money and to win. But funny enough, the gimmick is that you don't have to go for the nearest checkpoint first and face a strong competition for it, you may as well start with the last or any of the middle ones. The important thing is that you go through all of them. What's more, there's caps. And yes, since it's a racer, you will break the law by driving too fast or on the wrong side of the road. And they will chase you. If you let them catch you, cause you're you and if you wouldn't just let them, they'd never stood the chance of doing so on their own, they will fine you and the money will be subtracted from your budget. Money is awarded by getting to the flags first or bumping into cash trucks. Yeah, you'll know them when you see them. Don't worry, they stick out. The biggest and most unique feature of the Outlaw Racers though are the cities which are entirely random generated, meaning that no trucks are ever the same and no two racers would follow the same path. If you're done with a particular city, you may look for a hyper transport system that for a small fee will generate a new city for you to race around in. You can buy new cars or upgrade the existing one, but since the upgrade system is quite simplistic, more often than not, it's easier and better to just get a new one. If you can afford it, that is. While quite fun, Outlaw Racers never really managed to gain a huge traction and remained a rather little known and obscure game. While being the third game in the series, Return to Krondor is actually a direct sequel to the first and a third-person perspective fantasy turn-based role-playing. You once again in the world of Meet Kimia and once again it is in danger. Once a thief, now Squire of Krondor, James, along with William Condoin, a fearless swordsman and a couple of other braves, have to follow the trail of a ruthless mercenary named Bear to stop him before he finds and takes the Tear of the Gods for himself. A mysterious and powerful artifact that could change the world for the worse forever. Yup, the keyword here is wars. Oh well, such is medieval fantasy magical life it seems. As they go about that challenging but oh so glorious quest, they realize along the way that wherever they go, a horrible dark beings and perversions of nature are present there already. And there's something a mere mercenary, even one as evil as Bear, couldn't have caused all by himself. Condor itself, it seems, must be rotting from within with corruption. Unlike its predecessors, Return to Crondor is much less focused on exploration and freedom of movement, offering smaller and more confined areas. Especially that large chunk of the game takes place in the city of Crondor, in many of its districts. While it's impossible to travel the overworld anymore, later on in the game you will be able to visit some out of the city areas via quests that you'll acquire for them. And since we're on the subject, while there's only one main quest that will take you through the entire adventure, there are numerous side tasks that you may perform too. The leveling up system in Return to Crondor is more similar to other RPGs of the era rather than previous entries in the series, allowing you to allocate points to weapon proficiencies, defense, spellcasting and the likes by hand. There's also alchemy potions brewing, lockpicking minigame and encumbrance system which affects your mobility. The magic and melee are nicely balanced and a well-rounded party can quickly become the force of nature the enemies should fear. I feel that Return to Krondor is the weakest out of all games in the series and featuring no emotional story and a very straightforward twistless plot, it's not something that will keep you on the edge of your seat while playing. The House of the Dead originated in the arcades and it's one of the very best on-rail shooters ever made. Also, one with the most stupid story that you've ever heard. Not that the story is important at all in the shooters. So get that. Your girlfriend Sarah leaves you a message on your answering machine telling you that she's been captured by a bad guy called Curian. Now, imagine how nice of a kidnapper that dude had to be not only to let her call you, but also tell you what happened and who he is. What a stand-up guy. A gentleman and a scholar. Now, you being a staff and as courageous as you are, decide to follow the crumbles, or whole cookie pieces I should say really as you know exactly who to look for, and get Sarah back. As the game begins, it becomes clear that the title was not lost on it, and that while you're after Sarah, who you'll be fighting to get to her are not Curian's goons, but in the grand majority the undead. As in zombies, you know, the brain-hungry animalistic devoid of anything human monstrosities. House of the Dead is composed out of four stages, each of which ends with a boss fight. For the first three you get a clear rundown of what their weak spots are, the last however you have to figure it out all by yourself. Now, even if most on-rail shooters can be let's say powered through quickly and accurately downing enemies as soon as they pop up, in House of the Dead you have to be careful while shooting not to hit the innocents as shooting a civilian will cost you a life. That said, same as all the others in the genre, it's basically a memorization game. So the sooner you remember where enemies pop up from and in what order, the sooner you'll be able to breeze through the stages. Even if a bit difficult at first, it's one of those titles that when repeated often enough, in time it will offer close to no challenge whatsoever. 
So, if you're a fan of all the Virtua Cup games, House of the Dead is basically the same, but better, so you'll know that enjoy getting lost in its arcade decapitations and blood-filled gameplay loop. Rayman Forever is a compilation release that brought the amazing original game to new heights. By releasing Rayman, along with 24 completely new levels made by the devs, 40 best ones made by the fan community and submitted to the Ubisoft's website, and the so-called Rayman Designer, level editor that could extend the life of the game quite considerably, allowing you to create your own levels too. What is Rayman though? Well, it's a proof that PC could pull off platformers as good, if not better than those found on consoles. Running super smoothly and compost in rich colorful through backgrounds and melodic music, with excellent sounds and intricate, perfectly thought out level design. And all that with ease, no less. And not too demanding on the hardware. Rayman is a classic story of good versus evil, so Rayman versus Mr. Dark respectively, and it's an action platformer featuring our unusual hero. One that does not have arms or legs, but has hands and feet despite that. Weird. How are they connected to his body? Nobody knows. But my best bet is on hopes, dreams and imagination. A mixture of all three in equal measures, keeping those extremities close, even if not directly connected. Aside from standard running and jumping found in other platformers, Rayman can also hover for a short while using his hair as a propeller and throw his fist in an attack. And yes, I meant what I said, throw, so that they could return to him like some kind of a hand boomerang. They can be wound up too for a more powerful punch, like a knockout strong one. In the end, Rayman is the best of the best the system could do when it came to action platforming, a benchmark for 2D action platformers for years to come, and an incredibly fun and easy to pick up title that I believe everyone should try, as it's the best example of what PC was capable of if given a chance and some talent thrown at it. Also, it's as good today as it was years ago. The Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard is third-person perspective action-adventure set in Bethesda's world of Tamriel. Redguard takes place around 400 years before the events of the arena, first in the Elder Scrolls mainline games, and thus is a prequel to all the other games in the series. And unlike most Bethesda's games of the time, it's not an RPG and only has few small bits and pieces inspired by them, namely quests and money management. Other than that, it's a 3D arcade adventure, placing you in the shoes of Cyrus, a Redguard mercenary and a well-known hero, who has to travel to the port city of Strosemkai in Hammerfell and investigate his sister Izara's mysterious disappearance. As you do just that, you'll soon realize that there's much bigger and sinister political intrigue at play, and it will require solving too. The game is rather open, allowing you to free roam its many areas and tackle quests in a non-linear fashion. Plot may demand completion of certain quests and acquiring of specific items to push forward most of the time, but occasionally a conversation prompt with a correct character may be needed for progress too. Naturally, as in most action-adventure games, Redguard's full of it. So action and adventuring. No shit, Sherlock. And that action bit of it is pretty straightforward, composed mainly of slashing, stabbing and even some simple combos dependent on the key's input combinations and active blocking. So, putting enemies and monsters down left and right as necessary is what you'll be doing all the time, cutting through ocean worth of enemies, all the while looking for your sister. Adventuring, however, consists of rather robust conversation trees and puzzling. And while first are self-explanatory, the puzzles are all different and can be inventory, mechanical or logic based some of them being mandatory, others optional side ones. Interestingly enough, these optional puzzles are often more fun than the ones that you have to complete to progress. If you're looking for an RPG experience when playing Redguard, you'll be disappointed. There's no attributes, no real feeling of a character progression, and nothing that would make it even remotely feel like a true RPG. But if you just want to have fun, and like Tomb Raider adjacent titles, then you may have a blast here. Fallout 2 is a post-apocalyptic sci-fi role-playing and a sequel to year prior's first Fallout. Also one of my most beloved games of all time. Why? Oh, my dear Watson, it's rather elementary. It's just the best. Simple as that. It takes place in 2241, 8 years after the events of the first game and 164 years after the Atomic War, which reduced majority of the world to the shadow of its former self. To irradiated wasteland that can support close to no life, be it fauna or flora. This time, however, you do not hail from the vault, but are the chosen one. Nope, 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 no, 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 not Neo from The Matrix, someone much less complex. A tribal villager from Arroyo, who happens to be a grandchild of a hero from the first game, and the first person that somehow managed to survive and complete the village's temple of trials. In the first game, you are searching for a water chip. In second, funny enough, quite early in your adventure, you'll find whole palettes worth of these, just lying around gathering dust. This time, you're looking for love, and in all the wrong places, I must add. Wait a minute, I must have mixed up all my scripts. Give me a sec. 
It's gotta be here somewhere. Mm, mm, yeah, mm, yeah, I got it. See, I knew you were looking for something tech related and it's a gag, as in Garden of Eden Creation Kit. A pre-war vault tech that allows for turning even entirely dead soil into one that will be able to sustain life for years to come. Your as funny as dark adventure will take you through most of West Coast US. You'll meet many of its factions and tons of incredibly interesting characters, eventually leaving your undeniable mark not only on all of them individually, but also on the history of the region and future of soon-to-be reborn America. Your character is built out of six special attributes, so strength, perception, endurance, charisma, intelligence, agility and luck. And what's so special about them? Well, fans of the series will get that silly little joke of mine. Anyway, each of the attributes corresponds directly to one of many different skills, divided into three groups of combat, active and passive. And this can be stuff like small or big guns, unarmed combat, sneak, lockpick, first aid, stealing, repair, speech, outdoorsman and many more. And all of them, every single one of them, works. It's called up upon numerous times throughout each game and is very, very important. Best of all, it's virtually impossible to create a character that's a master of all, so each playthrough with a different build may feel and play out entirely unique. I mean, in one game you may be a huge mountain of muscles that takes all the enemies head on, either with his fists or melee weapons, bludgeoning them into a bloody pulp, while in another you may opt out to be a sniper. Heck, you may complete the entire game never taking a single shot or throwing a punch if you'd like to. Sure, it will require a bit of mental gymnastics and a couple of daring escapes, but it's possible. A pacifist run, can you imagine? Also, having your intelligence at highest rating will often allow you to access extra dialogue options, and on the flip side, having it as low as possible changes all the dialogues in the entire game to near incomprehensible mumble, as you'll literally be playing someone so mentally incapable that they're not only having problem understanding what others are saying, but also even expressing their own thoughts. So someone like me, and Migo, you look bad, angry, I run, now, is not something out of ordinary if you go down that route. Effectively a grown-up infant. Now, does that sound interesting to you? Well, I haven't even licked the oh-so-sweet surface of this tasty candy of a game. There are numerous factions in Fallout 2, all with their own agendas, schemes and goals. They may cooperate, they may compete against each other and each of them forms their own opinion about you based on your actions. The creatures that survived or evolved or mutated or arrived to populate the world of Fallout are all hella interesting too. And stuff like two-headed Brahmin, huge geckos or even ghouls and super mutants will be the least unusual ones of them all, trust me. Fallout 2 is a game that cannot be spoken about in a way that would explain everything that it's all about. At least, not in a video like this one. It has to be experienced. Preferably in series of playthroughs with differently built characters, all aiming to have the wasteland recall their influence and importance in its history differently. Oh, also, Fallout 2 taught me what kind of a job Fluffer does. And it was not something I ever expected to learn from the game. Or at all, really. So yeah, there's that too. If you get a chance, drop everything else and play it. Loadrunner 2 recreates the classic platformer in 3D, only not really 3D. It is however viewed from an isometric perspective and allows for movement in all three directions, so it kinda sorta also is. I know, I'm confusing you, but trust me, I'm confusing myself too. This time you can control both a male and female character, so Jack and Jane respectively, and other than the gender, they don't differ at all and have the exact same characteristics and capabilities. Unlike most other remakes of classic arcade puzzlers, however, Load Runner 2 takes full advantage of that third axis and is actually really, really fun to play. It's all about collecting all the gold in each of the stages, all the while avoiding constantly chasing you evil monks. And as per usual, you can dig to platform your way around the stages or to trap those pesky monks. There's three kinds of these, purple, blue and black. First loves ripe plums, second appreciates staring at the sky and imagining that the clouds take forms of various everyday items, and the last is a priest, a satanic priest at that. And once again, I've mixed up my scripts. Someone's gonna have to take responsibility for all these mistakes at some point. And it's sure as hell is not going to be me. I wish Batman was here. He was always an exceptional scapegoat. Anyway, as I was saying, there are three kinds of monks and they really are of these three forementioned colors. Colors that mean something completely different though. Blue monks are blind and always follow a particular preset pattern of movement, a path if you will, so if you keep out of the way, they're not that dangerous. The purple monks, which are most similar to those found in the original, so they chase you and generally speaking try to act in a surprising and unpredictable manner. And finally, black monks are like the purple, but much, much, much smarter. They will chase you no matter what. 
they will try to lock you in and circle you if possible and outsmarting them in some of those more difficult stages may not be as easy as one would like. There are naturally bombs and various other power-ups in the game and while I will let you discover them on your own, I'll give you a single hint. If you get a chance to grab a beach ball power-up, do it. Don't think twice of it. And in the words of one of the 20th century's most brilliant philosopher, Lord Byron Michael Bartholomew Nike III, just do it. It's gonna be a blasphemy, but I was not a fan of Tomb Raider 3. In fact, I was not a fan of any Tomb Raider apart from the first two until they were remade from ground up as Tomb Raider, Rise of the Tomb Raider and Shadow of the Tomb Raider in the late 2010s. So yeah, I completely overlooked 15 years worth of games in the series. But it doesn't mean that there was anything wrong with Tomb Raider 3. Quite the contrary. The third and most others were rather fun and easily better than the first two, both technically and presentation-wise. So why did I only give them a passing interest and never completed any of them? Well, I think the charm of the never-before-seen quote-unquote new that struck me with the first two was long gone with the others and I was more into different kinds of games back then. As a result of that, I had no place in my gaming life for more Tomb Raiding then. I've since saw most of these that I missed, but given how incredibly good the new trilogy was, I was not going to be completing the old ones anytime soon. Anyway, naturally, as per usual, in Tomb Raider 3 you're playing as Lara Croft, the second sexiest video game heroine ever. First, naturally being Miss Pac-Man. She had that X factor that no other female video game protagonist had since, even jiggle physics friendly Miss Croft. Anyway, in this one, Lara has to travel to India in search of the legendary stone that once belonged to the tribe of Infada. Shortly after doing so, because of course that she managed to recover it as fast as it takes a magician to take a rabbit out of his hat, she is met by Dr. Willard, a head of a mysterious organization known only as RX Tech. He tells our boobalicious protagonist that she has three more of these to find to complete the set of four, and that having all would help her uncover the secret of the long-lost Polynesian civilization that worshipped the meteorite that the stones are made out of. Tomb Raider 3, same as the ones before and after, is a full 3D action-adventure platformer with a lot of puzzle solving. Granted, most of the time rather simple puzzling, but puzzling nonetheless. Lara still can run, jump, dive, swim, climb, roll, crouch, crawl, sprint, swing on bars and vines and naturally, and most of all, pew 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 her way out of any and all dangers using various different weapons. You know, pistols, shotguns, harpoons, uzis and more. Stuff that every modern, self-respecting, adventuring lady should master the use of. Interestingly enough, Tomb Raider 3 allowed for tackling of levels other than the introductory first in any order, making it one of the few non-linear games in the long-running series. How do you like 1998 so far? I never thought it possible when covering 1997, but it may have actually overtaken it in quality of the releases. What do you think though? Let me know in the comments below. Now, have you ever stared at the night sky and wondered why we've never met any intelligent species? Well, a so-called Fermi paradox deals with it actually. In essence, it's a discrepancy between the lack of conclusive evidence of advanced extraterrestrial life and the apparent high likelihood of its existence given the sheer number of potentially habitable planets in the universe. So, if there are millions, billions even of galaxies, each with as many solar systems, then where is everyone? Well, there are a few potential explanations. The simplest and most obvious may be that we just haven't searched hard enough or don't have the technology to do so yet. The interstellar travel is also a rather difficult task, however you wanna look at it. And if the current laws of physics happen to be definite and true, then traveling faster than light is not only impossible, but also the speed of light itself is way too slow for us to cover the universe at any reasonable pace. I mean, we have warp speed, based on warp bubble. Excuse me, let me rephrase it. We don't have warp speed, but we have theories and a working nano model of the bubble and not the travel to be clear. I think we've tackled it in one of the outros to the earlier videos. So yeah, that doesn't help either. Another explanation may be that other, more advanced civilizations after watching us for a while decided not to pay us a visit. We are, after all, aggressive and dangerous to even ourselves. Or on the flip side, they did and we just never noticed. That's feasible too. It's also possible, even if seems unreasonable to assume so, that we are really unique and the only species at a high enough level of development to even consider the possibility of meeting anyone. So, no one paid us a visit, as there's no one there to do so. It's a rather sad and lonely assumption, but as good as any other, I feel. Or perhaps there are other intelligent life forms, but they're so rare that chances of them being anywhere near each other, and us for that matter too, are so low that it's more probable that we'll win a lottery 100 times in a row than us ever meeting them. 
Who knows? It's fun to consider it though. Well, a very difficult factor to overcome in all of this is also the sheer size of the universe. I mean, if you grab two tennis balls and keep them two inches apart, drawing a straight line from one another in many cases may hit the other. But if you spread them a feet, a meter or even a mile apart, then with each larger distance the chances are incomparably smaller. Impossible even. And now imagine Earth in the vastness of space. We're not a tennis ball, we're smaller than an atom that the ball is made out of. And finally, we've reached so-called the Great Filter. A theory that assumes that the biggest factor preventing us from meeting one another is a catastrophic, civilization-ending event that's either natural and random or man-made. Well, alien-made when talking about other species. Stopping, nay, preventing a civilization from reaching a level of advancement that would allow it to truly conquer the stars and go where no one has gone before. Interestingly enough, our own metaphorical inventor of a doomsday clock brilliantly writes itself into the whole Great Filter theory. We've not reached the midnight yet, but we know where we are and when it will happen, more or less. And ladies and gentlemen, we're 90 seconds from 12 as of January 2024. If you have your 5 cents to add here, your own theories, cause you know, a simulation theory explains it as well as any other does, make sure to let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.